So this morning we're continuing uh, in Ezekiel and concluding the book in a three-part series, the last of our three-part series that I've entitled Israel and the End Times. Remember that the final 13 chapters of the book of Ezekiel are prophetic in nature, some of which have uh, been fulfilled and much of which has yet to be fulfilled. And if you've been here over the past couple of weeks, you know that the last 13 chapters have basically been broken down like this. Chapters 36 and 37, Ezekiel prophesied about the reestablishment of the state of Israel. That was fulfilled in 1948. In chapters 38 and 39, he spoke about nations that would converge in a confederation of nations that would culminate in the Battle of Armageddon. So chapters 38 and 39 not necessarily specific about the Battle of Armageddon, but events leading up to and eventually including the Battle of Armageddon, which is only mentioned Armageddon once in the Bible, Revelation chapter 16. But Ezekiel sees these things, the Lord shows him in advance these nations that converge, and he writes about it there in chapters 38 and 39. That was last week's study. And then for today, we're going to be looking at chapters 40 to 48 which deal with the kingdom age, also known as the millennial reign of Christ. So Ezekiel is given this vision by the Lord, and he sees way down past his day, certainly. And these chapters are past our day as well, but we're looking forward to the imminent return of Christ. How many of you are looking forward to the fact that Jesus is coming again? But unlike the meek and mild baby Jesus at his first coming, his second coming will be with fire in his eyes, and he will be riding a white horse, and he will make war with all the nations that have come against Israel and the God of Israel, and he will settle that battle once and for all known as the Battle of Armageddon. And when he finishes defeating those nations that have come against Israel and the God of Israel, The Bible says that he then makes his way to the Temple Mount of the city of Jerusalem, and he enters through the East Gate, and he establishes himself on the throne in the Temple of Jerusalem that has yet to be built, and he will rule and reign over the earth for a thousand years. Thus, that's the kingdom age or the millennial reign. And um, this is what God shows Ezekiel here. God gives Ezekiel great detail about this future temple that will be built. And he gives Ezekiel even the detail of which gate our Lord will enter as he comes into Jerusalem for that kingdom age, for that millennial reign. And so here in chapter 43, I'm going to read the first five verses, which talk about that a little bit here. Chapter 43, verses 1 through 5. And afterward, he brought me to the gate. Ezekiel writes here about how the Lord is showing him these things. The gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Kabar, and I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So Ezekiel sees this day when the Lord returns, and when the Lord returns, The glory of the Lord returns and fills this temple yet to be built uh, in Jerusalem. Now, interestingly, David, uh, King David wrote something similar. The Lord had shown him this day as well. And in Psalm chapter 24, David writes this in verses 7 through 10. He says, lift up your, your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So David sees this day as well. Now remember, 
If you weren't here for the earlier uh, chapters of Ezekiel, in back in chapter 10, verse 18, Ezekiel is given a vision by the Lord of seeing the glory of the Lord depart from Jerusalem because of the idolatry and the sin of the people. God's glory left the temple area there. And then here, God is giving Ezekiel the privilege of seeing way into the future when the glory of the Lord shall return to Jerusalem and fill the whole earth because the presence of the Lord returns. And so when he does, and when he establishes himself on the throne of this temple that will be built in Jerusalem, and he rules and reigns for a thousand years, this is the kingdom age. This is what Ezekiel is talking about. So we're going to unpack these last few chapters here together and understand what all this means to us as we kind of look into the future through the lens of the prophet Ezekiel. So let's pray first, and then we'll unpack these chapters together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your love in our lives, and we thank you that you've given us information about the future, that we might be ready, that you would find us faithful and watching, that our hearts would be prepared, that our lives would be lived in such a way to honor you in holiness, that we, Lord, would welcome your blessed return. It is the hope of the church that you are coming again. So fill our hearts with anticipation and joy and help us not to be weighed down by the cares of this world and to grow weary by by all the things that we see happening around us. But Lord, may we just leave here today rejoicing with the reminder, or maybe for some, the information for the first time that you're coming again, Lord. And we just look forward to that day. We love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So uh, on the wall behind me is uh, a picture of today's Eastern Gate located along the city wall of Jerusalem. This picture will be taken from the Mount of Olives uh, looking west so that you see the Eastern Gate of the city of Jerusalem. This is also known as the Golden Gate. And it is the only gate that has been walled up and shut uh, among the different gates in the old city of Jerusalem. It's a a double-arched gate that has been uh, blockaded since 810 A.D. when the Muslims walled it up. It was briefly opened again in 1102 A.D. uh, by the Crusaders. And, uh, and then it was walled up uh, again by Saladin, the first sultan of Egypt, after regaining Jerusalem in 1187 AD. The eastern gate here that you're seeing behind me was ultimately sealed and completely barricaded uh, by the Muslims in 1541 AD by the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman. And It was a defensive move on his part. Suleiman knew the Jewish scriptures, and he knew the scriptures that we are even looking at today. And in a defensive move, he permanently walled over the Eastern Gate because he knew that the Jewish scriptures said that the Messiah would come through the Eastern Gate. And in order to try to fortify the gate even further, Suleiman placed, if you'll notice at the lower part of the picture, placed a Muslim cemetery in front of the gate because he also knew that the Jewish scriptures said that a Kohen or a priest would never defile himself and walk among dead bodies. So Suleiman figured that he could keep out the Messiah with some rocks and a cemetery. (laughs) But how many of you know, when Jesus comes again, he's going through that wall. It doesn't matter what's in front of him. He's going through that wall, and he's taking his rightful place on the throne on the temple of Jerusalem. Now, it may not necessarily be this exact gate that he walks through. And I say that only because the Bible says when Jesus returns again, there will be a great earthquake. And I suspect that just about everything's going to be leveled on the Temple Mount. Because presently, you have no Jewish temple. Presently, you have two Muslim sanctuaries, the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Jesus is not going to share the territory with um, other gods. And so when he returns, 
the walls might be leveled, certainly the mosques are going to be leveled, and he's going to set himself up and rule and reign. Whether the wall stands through the earthquake or not is kind of immaterial. There will be some gate on the eastern side that Jesus will walk through, irrespective of what Suleiman tried to do. Uh, Jesus is coming again. He's going to make his way from the Mount of Olives over the Kidron Valley into the city of Jerusalem through the east gate, and nothing and no one will stop him from setting up his throne in the temple of Jerusalem. Now, the temple that Jesus will occupy, again, is presently not there. It will end up being the fourth temple. The first temple, just by way of just a brief review, the first temple was built by Solomon in the 900s B.C., Uh, The plans were given to his father, David, but God said to David, because you have shed blood, uh, your hands have have blood on them and in war, and thus you cannot build me a temple, your son will build it. But God gave David all the specifications and the drawings, and then David contributed out of his own personal resources for the building of the temple. So Solomon built the first temple, and it would stand about 500 years until 586 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, would come, destroy the city of Jerusalem, destroy and level the temple. And then it would be rebuilt after the Jews finished their period of captivity in Babylon, and the Lord graciously returned them under the leadership of Ezra, and then also Nehemiah, who would rebuild the walls of the city. Ezra would lead a group of Jewish people to rebuild the temple. The second temple would not be as glorious as the first. And even those who could remember the first would weep at the building of the second because it paled in comparison to the first temple. But nevertheless, they would build a temple. It would be the second temple. King Herod the Great, centuries later, would come along and refurbish that second temple as a way to ingratiate himself with the Jewish people. And this wonderful, extensive building project would happen under the leadership of King Herod the Great. That would be the temple, still considered the second temple, during the time of Jesus' ministry. But then that temple would be destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans under the emperor Titus Vespasian, who would lead a military campaign against Jerusalem because of a revolt among the Jewish people against the Roman Empire. That second temple would be leveled, and it has remained empty to this day. No Jewish temple since 70 AD has existed on the Temple Mount of the city of Jerusalem. The Bible says, however, that that's going to change, that there will be a third temple to be built, and that temple will be occupied by the Antichrist. There will be a peace agreement, the book of Daniel says, for a period of seven years where some very charismatic global leader will occupy the world stage. He will convince Muslims and Jews and Gentiles to get along and divide up the Temple Mount. And once again, a Jewish temple will be built on the Temple Mount under the auspices of the Antichrist. But the Bible says that he will come into that temple, the Antichrist, and he will proclaim himself to be God. And then the eyes of people will be opened to realize that they've been deceived. That's the third temple. But then our Lord returns, and when He returns, that great earthquake, that temple and all other remnants of other temples will be completely destroyed, and then this fourth temple will be built. Jesus will occupy it. From there, He will rule and He will reign. The last nine chapters of the book of Ezekiel, this is a bit of information overload, and I'm going to try to break it down and help us to see it from 30,000 feet rather than to try to get bogged down in the weeds. But you can divide the last nine chapter, uh, the la- last nine chapters in three sections like this. In chapters 40 to 42, Ezekiel writes about the description of this new temple. In chapters 43 to 44, he writes about the worship in the temple. And then chapters 45 to 48, he talks about the land around the temple. He's very meticulous and detailed. God gives him the measurements, instructions about the design, and he sees all this, and he writes it down using the measurement of the ancient Babylonian cubit, which was a royal cubit, the length of 21 inches. And so everything is spelled out, and, and, it, and it probably would not do us well to just go through every single detail. You can read all of it on your own. But in order for us to see this from a bird's eye view, Uh, I'm going to, instead of following that pattern of these three sections, I'm going to instead teach it from this perspective. What will be different, absent, and present about the millennial reign and the temple? 
what will be different about that time, what will be missing, what will be absent, and what will be present, what will be there about the millennial reign and the temple. Now, before we look into these three things, first question, where do we fit into all of this? Where do we see ourselves in the timeline of events? And so I first want to just share a timeline with us so that we can kind of get a perspective of what exactly Ezekiel is talking about so we can orient ourselves about things that are to come. So let's talk history first. Jesus was crucified, he rose from the dead, and he ascended back into heaven. That's all recorded in the Bible. That's history, and that's present tense, because Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father. When Jesus ascended back into heaven, it ushered in the church age. We are presently living in the church age, where Jesus basically hands us the baton. He says, now, I want you to represent me in the world. I want you to be salt and light in the world. I want you to tell people about me, that as many people as possible would come to faith in Jesus Christ. This is the church age. We're living in it right now. The next thing that's going to happen on the timeline of events that is still to come will be the rapture of the church. That is to say that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, there's a generation that will not experience death. There will be a moment in time, the Bible says, when the Lord will return just in the clouds, not all the way to the earth, just in the clouds, and the trumpet call of God will sound. And it talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the dead in Christ will rise first to get glorified bodies, even though their spirits have already been in heaven, their bodies rise from the grave to be glorified and reunited with their spirit. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord forever. So there's a generation of us that will never experience death. We will be transformed. We will get a glorified body on the way up when the Lord returns to gather us in the clouds with Him. Then we will be kept in heaven during this seven years of tribulation. And during the seven years of tribulation, there will be cataclysmic natural disasters that have never been experienced on planet Earth before. It's recorded in Revelation 6 through 18. The reason is because God is trying to get people's attention for the very last time. You know, the harder you resist God, the more He has to hit you with a bigger two-by-four. Have you noticed that in your life? If you just continue to turn a deaf ear to God, He's going to have to hit harder because He wants to get your attention. And so, all of us can relate at some point when, when we've been met with the very gentle two-by-four of God, because we've been stubborn and rebellious, and we've been going a different direction. Seven years of tribulation is God's final wake-up call for a Christ-rejecting, God-forsaking world. So, events will be horrible on the earth, but it's an extreme measure to get the attention of one last generation before He comes again to the earth. And when he comes again to the earth, he will bring the saints with him who have already died or been raptured and kept in heaven. And the Bible says that we will come again with the Lord, and then he will settle, his second coming settles the battle of Armageddon, ends the seven years of tribulation, and ushers in the kingdom age or the millennial reign of Christ. This is what Ezekiel's talking about here in these last few chapters. He's talking about the thousand-year period of time when Christ returns to the earth, the saints with him, battle of Armageddon done, all the nations opposed to him defeated. He separates the righteous from the unrighteous, and now we rule and reign with him, the saints who have returned with Jesus on earth for a thousand years. After this, there's a new heaven and a new earth. That's not for today's Bible study. People who accept Christ during the seven years of tribulation, it's possible to accept him during that time period, will enter into the millennial kingdom and basically live out the rest of their lives like normal. But the saints who return with Jesus will rule and reign with Him for that thousand years. This is what Ezekiel is seeing. God is showing him way in advance. I mean, he's 6th century B.C. He's seeing things beyond our time. And he's looking ahead to this day when Christ returns. Where do we fit in with all of that? Listen again. If you die knowing Christ as your Savior, or if you are raptured knowing Christ as your Savior, you will be kept in heaven, and then we will return with the Lord, all right? Or either that, or a person can get saved during the seven years of tribulation and come into the millennial reign of Christ and live out their normal life, all right? But that's where we will be in there somewhere, either returning with Him, or if you're not saved already, getting saved during the tribulation period and entering the millennial reign, living out your life as normal. Now, I notice some of you, again, like the last few many chapters of Ezekiel has been 
as I've been teaching, it's like, you know, I know you think you're drinking out of a fire hose. I get that. And I wish it was just a garden hose, but, you know, there's a lot of information. But it's important for you to know this, okay? It's important for us to have our hearts prepared and to know. There's going to be the rapture of the church. God's going to take us home. He's going to come again. He's going to rule and reign on the earth. You need to be equipped to know this. Frankly, for personal reasons, I don't want to be embarrassed, all right? Because there's going to be a day, all right, if you know Christ is your Savior, and you're going to, don't, don't say that, don't go, Jesus, I didn't know you were coming again. I didn't know that. Because then he's, then he's going to say, what church do you go to? All right? So you need to know this. We all need to know this. He's coming again. And so let's talk about how things will be different, absent, and present. Revelation 20, verse 6 says, the saints will be priests of God and of Christ, and we will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, it's interesting that Ezekiel tells us in chapter 44, verse 15, that the actual priests who will serve during the millennial period of time will only be Jewish believers, specifically who are of the tribe of Levi through the descendants of Aaron and Zadok. God is very specific here in Ezekiel 44, verse 15. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me. And so it appears in the Bible that when the Lord returns, Jewish believers will serve as priests, or at least some of them will be assigned, those who are descendants of Aaron through Zadok, will be assigned as priests to serve the Lord in spiritual matters and ministry. And then other believers, meaning Gentiles, will help him serving under our Lord Jesus to administrate the rest of the world, to help rule and reign with him. That in other words, we, the saints will be serving as, you know, like, like governors and, 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 and be um, responsible as like mayors of, of like territories and areas. So that's, that's going to be our assignment during the millennial reign. That's how we're going to rule and reign with him. And just so you know, I'm just letting you know in advance, I already have Bermuda. All right. I already have, I already have Bermuda. I put it in uh, years ago and, um, and it's been approved. So that's where I'm going to be. Now, what will be different here? Ezekiel does not spend too much talking about life itself and how it will be different during the millennial reign. He talks more specifically about the temple, but other prophets do talk about how life will be different during the millennial reign. Isaiah, in particular, has more to say about what life will be like than really just about any other prophet. And a couple of the things that Isaiah tells us is, number one, that it will be a time of unprecedented peace. They have to imagine, of course it will, because Jesus is going to be on the throne. And, uh, you know, and I, I know this might get a little applause, and, and maybe rightfully so, but um, Jesus is on the throne, and he's going to be ruling and reigning the world from Jerusalem. There will be no more government in Washington, D.C., okay? And there, and there will be no more government in any other nation because there's going to be one king, and his name is Jesus, and he's going to rule the whole world, okay? Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, too. So you can imagine with Jesus being king and ruling the whole world, there's going to be unprecedented peace. Even so much so that Isaiah writes in chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, that the animal kingdom will be at peace within itself and at peace with human beings such that children, it tells us in Isaiah 11, will play with snakes and not be bitten. Isaiah also tells us it'll be a time of longevity. People will live a lot longer than they presently live. In Isaiah 65, 20, he says, he who dies at a hundred will be a mere youth. But in other ways, life will be very similar to how it is now. For believers who survive, who survive the tribulation period and they go into the millennial period, they will be living their lives pretty much as usual. They will be getting married. They will have families. They will be working jobs. They will be building homes. And they will settle down just like we do now. It's not yet heaven on earth. There's a new heaven and a new earth that comes after the thousand years. But that thousand years, you have to try to imagine. King Jesus on the throne, a time of peace, a time of longevity. People are still working jobs, getting married, living life pretty much as usual. But it'll be a very different feel. And during this time, Revelation chapter 20 tells us that Satan will be bound for that thousand years. And you better applaud that as much as you did Washington, D.C. being absent. 
Satan's going to be bound for that thousand years. He's going to be let out again, the Bible says, to try to deceive the nations one last time, and then he'll be thrown into the lake of fire where he will be tormented forever and ever. But try to imagine a world without Satan. I mean, now, it doesn't mean it, the world will be absent of sin because people who survive the tribulation and come into the millennial reign will still have sin nature. So people will still be sinning and saying stupid things and tweeting dumb things and all this kind of stuff. Um, but you have to imagine the, the level of evil a lot less without the influence of Satan. Crime a lot less without the influence of Satan. No more wars. No more wars under, under King Jesus. One united world under our Lord. The laws will all be righteous. Everything will be in a, a state of utopia in some ways. Um, and, and so life will be very different while Satan is bound for those thousand years. Something else very different. Ezekiel tells us that the Old Testament sacrifices will be reinstated. Now, this seems bizarre at first, but I want you to read the passage with me, and then I'll explain. Go backwards to chapter 43. I'm going to have you jump all over these last few chapters here, but back to chapter 43, verses 18 to 21. And he said to me, Ezekiel said, the Lord said to him, Son of man, thus says the Lord God, these are the ordinances for the altar on the day when it is made for sacrificing burnt offerings on it and for sprinkling blood on it. You shall give a young bull for a sin offering to the priests, the Levites, who are of the seed of Zadok, who approach me to minister to me, says the Lord God. You shall take some of its blood and put it on the four horns of the altar, on the four corners of the ledge, and on the rim around it. Thus, you shall cleanse it and make atonement for it. Then you shall also take the bull of the sin offering and burn it in the appointed place of the temple outside the sanctuary. Your attention, please. So this seems bizarre at first glance. Why in the world would we revisit the Old Testament sacrifices seeing that Jesus has come, died for our sins, been raised again, now rules and reigns for a thousand years? Here's the reason why. The Old Testament sacrifices that the Jews practiced were implemented as a way to provide temporary atonement for their sins until such time that Christ could be revealed on the cross. When Christ was revealed, He became the permanent sacrifice for all people, for all times, for all sins. So when the people in the Old Testament were sacrificing animals, they were looking ahead to the cross. They were looking forward to the cross by sacrificing these animals. During the millennial reign, when the sacrifices are brought back, it will be the, for the purpose of not looking forward, but for looking backwards and remembering the cross. Because for the people who are born during this millennial period of time, they are disconnected from the cross and from the sacrifice. So here's Jesus ruling and reigning in the temple, and He calls them to make sacrifices looking back to have a tangible reminder of what Christ did for us on the cross. The sacrifices don't save anybody. They never did. The sacrifices were a way of looking forward in the Old Testament and in the millennial period looking backward to the cross. In a similar way, think about it. When we have communion here, when we share the Lord's Supper together, what are we doing? We're looking back to the cross. We're reminding ourselves of what Christ did for us in the past for our sins in the present and in the future. So it's something that they will practice in memoriam, in reminder and in memory of what Christ has done in celebration of what He's done. That's for the people who are living during the millennial reign. We who return with Christ, we're already in our glorified bodies. We're not a part of this. We're just helping Him as priests, Jewish believers, and as administrators, Gentile believers around the world. Another thing that's going to be very different the Bible says here in Ezekiel chapter 47 that the Dead Sea will become fresh water. Go to chapter 47. Let me show this to you real quickly. The Bible says to us in the prophet Zechariah and also here in Ezekiel that there will be a fresh water river that starts in Jerusalem from under the south side of the temple and flows south into the Dead Sea. So here in chapter 47, verses 8 through 12, this is where Ezekiel sees this. Verse 8, then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. And when it reaches the sea, the Dead Sea, 
its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi, which is a spot down by the Dead Sea that we visit when we go on tours, to En Galim, and they will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, meaning the Mediterranean, exceedingly many. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. So the marshy area will still st stay salty, but the body of the water will become fresh. And verse 12, along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their, le their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. So your attention, the entire desert region of the Dead Sea will be completely transformed because fresh water will flow from Jerusalem down the Jordan Valley into the Dead Sea, making it fresh water. Now, the, the Dead Sea is the lowest point on the face of the earth. It is also the saltiest body on the face of the earth. Next to it is, I think, uh, the, 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 the Great Salt Lake in Utah, which is about 17% salinity. The Dead Sea is 37% salinity. Compared to the ocean, the, it's 10 times the salinity of the ocean. The ocean is 3.5% salinity. The Dead Sea, 37%, and the Bible says it's going to become fresh water. You know, when we go down to the Dead Sea on our different tours to Israel, those of you who have been with me, you get a chance to swim in it. It's like swimming in hot, oily jello. That's about the best way I can describe it. And because of the high salt content, it finds every nook and cranny in your body <laughs> as an antiseptic, all right? And so it's, but it's very medicinal too. The properties are very medicinal. My uh, dermatologist told me years ago that before the advancement of medical treatment for eczema, which now they can do with like light therapy, um, they used to have to do this very expensive treatment for people who suffered from terrible eczema. She said it was cheaper for her patients to fly down to the Dead Sea and spend a week and get treatment by swimming in the Dead Sea than the medical treatments that we had here. So the medicinal proper properties are pretty incredible even now, the Dead Sea. A lot of people go down there for, for its properties. But one day, it's going to become fresh water. Ezekiel says during the millennial period, it will be fresh water. So. What I tell people is, if you want to get a corner on the market, you want to start a business, start a bait and tackle shop down by the Dead Sea. They will laugh at you now, but I guarantee you, it's going to make you some money in the days to come. Number two, what will be absent? Real quickly, what will be absent during this time? The Lord shows Ezekiel a vision of inside the temple. And inside the temple, there are some things that are conspicuously missing. And what he shows him in chapter 41 is a bunch of measurements about the interior of the temple and the entrance to the temple and the width of the temple and all of this. And in chapter 41, verses 3 and 4, he says also, he went inside and measured the doorpost, two cubits, and the entrance, six cubits high, and the width of the entrance, seven cubits. And he, he measured the length, 20 cubits, and the width, 20 cubits, beyond the sanctuary. And he said to me, this is the most holy place. One of the things that is very noticeable about what is absent in the new temple is no curtain. There used to be, in Solomon's temple, Ezra's temple, there used to be a curtain that separated the most holy place, which which was visited by the presence of God, the glory of God, from the holy place, which was the rest of the sanctuary. Only the priest could go into the most holy place through that curtain. There is no curtain in the new temple that Jesus will occupy. And the reason is because Jesus has abolished that curtain. That curtain was a symbol of the fact that there was a disconnect and a distance between God and man. But Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20 says that Jesus opened up for us a new and living way through the curtain that is his body. No need for a curtain anymore. 
In fact, many of the articles are missing in this new temple. There is no silver or gold in the new temple. David contributed 100,000 talents of his own gold into the lining of the interior of the temple that Solomon built. 100,000 talents of gold is the equivalent of 3,750 tons of gold. That's $50 billion in today's time. David dedicated no silver, no gold, because Jesus in his glory is the beauty that adorns the sanctuary. No table of showbread because Jesus is the bread of life. No menorah in this new temple because Jesus is the light of the world. No ark of the covenant because Jesus is the mercy seat. He is our atonement. And finally, number three, what will be present? What will be present is the very presence of the glory of the Lord. One last verse, go to chapter 44, verse 4. In chapter 44, verse 4, it says this, also he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple, so I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell on my face. Ezekiel is undone by this vision. He saw back in chapter 10, the glory of the Lord depart the temple. God told him in chapter 8, the reason was because of the idolatry and perversion of the people. But now, Ezekiel has the privilege of seeing in the future, the glory of the Lord returning the very same way that his glory departed. It is a statement of the mercy of our Lord. He will return to the place where he at one point was not honored, not wanted, but he continued to pursue his people. He continues to pursue you and me, and the glory of the Lord shall one day return to the city of Jerusalem and to the world by his very presence. It's a terrible thing when the presence of the Lord is no longer in a place. Even in His omnipresence, God can choose to withdraw His glory from a place where He is not honored and not wanted. His glory had departed from the temple because the people had defiled themselves with idolatry and perversion. And God will remove His presence where there is unrepentant compromise. One of the worst examples of this story in the Bible is the story of Samson. Many of you are familiar with his story. He was a man of great physical strength, but terrible moral weakness. He had a real love for women more than he loved God. His desire for women mastered him more than the Lord was his master. And most of you know the story how Delilah, one of the women that he lusted after, played him for the fool. She made a deal with the Philistines, the perennial enemy of the Israelites. For a sum of money, I will find out the secret of his strength so that you can subdue him. His strength was really not because he was a gym rat. His strength was from the Lord. His strength was supernatural. But when he compromised his life, that supernatural strength of the Lord waned. And when Delilah had worn him down time and again from what's the reason, what's the reason, what's the reason, he finally gave her this symbol of his strength, symbol only. The strength was from the Lord, but it was his hair that he had not cut as a vow to God, that he was consecrated to God. And when she cut his hair while he was sleeping, one of the saddest verses in all of the Bible is Judges chapter 16 and verse 20. It says, when he awoke, he thought that he would go out and subdue the Philistines, just like he had always done before. But Judges 16, 20, the last part of it says, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. If you feel the absence of the Lord's presence, the good news is that in His mercy, He does not stay angry forever. He will return to the place that He had departed from. The return of the Lord is a reminder of the glory of the Lord. 
but we need to humble ourselves. We need to get right with God. Micah 7.18 says, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? Micah says, you do not stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. Do you know that your Father in heaven delights to show you mercy? If you feel estranged from him, there's no reason to. Because he's delighting to show mercy to those who would humble themselves and return to him. Listen, I don't know when Jesus is going to come again. But our time is shorter and shorter every day that passes until his imminent return. If you're not right with him, get right with him. Because he's coming again. He's going to take the church. He's going to rapture us. Then he's going to come to earth for a second time. He's going to defeat the armies that are opposed to Israel and to the God of Israel. And then he's going to set up his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Listen, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. God has prepared things for us, and he is giving us a glimpse of these things in Scripture here, that we would be ready, watching, hopeful, and longing for his return. Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us a glimpse into these things, that you are in fact coming again. May we be ready, Lord. If we're playing games with you, may we stop that even now. To get our hearts right with you, to turn our lives around towards you. How sad it was for Samson. He learned the hard way that compromise after compromise, eventually the Lord departed from him and he knew it not. Lord, we want to be ready. So I pray that if anyone here today is not in a right relationship with you, that they would turn to you because you delight to show mercy. Thank you for being a merciful God. Our hope, Lord, is in you, not in this world, not in our lives. Our hope is in you and the world to come to be with you forever and ever. And I pray, Lord, that we would take these things to heart and to remember that we can't even imagine what you have in store for us. To them that love you, Lord, find us faithful, we pray. Longing for your return. We love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.